What do you spend most of your time talking about? Think about what you've talked about the last five or six conversations of the weekend. What have, what have you been talking about? Deer season, right? The weather, really windy out. Local politics, anyone? Healthcare, yeah. I mean, that's what we tend to talk about. We talk, talk about things that are, they're, they're important, but uh, they tend to be kind of surface things, right? L look around the church here. L look, look around and what was the last thing you talked about with someone here in the church? Go ahead and look. Think about that. Yeah. You know, as you see all the people around you, I invite you to see that there's a lot more to each person than we tend to see. Uh, you all know how an iceberg works, right? You, you see just the top little chunk of it, and then there's like a huge, vast amount beneath the water, beneath the surface. I, I think, I don't think, I know that everyone in here is a lot like that. There, there's the, the surface stuff we talk about, but everyone here, there's a lot more to you than meets the eyes. Every person, every one of you here, there is more that then comes up in polite and common conversation. Each one of you here have had lives that matter. Each one of you here have had struggles and moments of joy. Each one of you here have talents that are simply amazing and tender places that need to be protected. I am firmly convinced that no one here is normal because I think that downplays how amazing each one of you are. Each one of you is a gift, a unique and beautiful child of God. There's a lot more going on than, than we commonly talk about, right? There's, there's the top tip of the iceberg and there's everything below the surface. But we don't get into those deep waters very often. We don't talk about what is important very often. And, and when you do, who do you call? If you, need to, if you found out right now that someone was born in your family, a new, new child is born, or that someone is ill or diagnosed with a disease, who, who do you call? Do you call your family? Do you call friends? Who, who do you call when something important matters? And you need to talk about joy or confusion or concern or worry, the things that really, the important matters, not the surface level stuff, but the stuff that's beneath the surface of the waters. Is it someone that's here at a church with you today? Is someone here the person you'd call when something important happens? <clears throat> that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at... How is the church meant to be woven together? A people who knows what's important about each other. People that get beneath the waters to get at the, the meat of, of life. Not just the weather and the hunting season, but get, get below just the tip of the iceberg to get into what is important in our lives. And, and to, to do so, I, I want to begin by uh, use, borrowing some wisdom from a fellow named Tex Sample. He's a, a pastor. Oh, he's over in Kansas City. And what he, when he talks about the Christian faith, he says, it's more than what happens above the eyeballs. To be a Christian is more than what happens in this, this top part of your head. It's about how we live. It's about the set of practices that, that we, we do. A set of practices that we will practice. And, and these set of practices, they need to be taught and they need to be practiced, much like any other thing that we would do in our lives. If, if you want to play basketball, how many free throws do you need to shoot and how often? And, and who would teach you? You wouldn't do it by yourself. So you would need someone to show you and help you. Or, or golf. I know anyone, y'all golf. I know there's some people in here who golf. How often do you need to get out on the, on the driving range and hit a bucket of balls? Or go out and play nine holes just to keep, keep your swing under control? And, and how often do you need to ask someone, well, wait a minute, can you help me with my, my swing? I, I have on occasion held a golf club. It's not pretty. I, I need a lot of help for those practices, right? So we have practices that we, we do, we practice, we seek instruction, because there's always, always someone better. And to follow Jesus is no different. To be Christian is no different. There are a set of practices that are, that are, are constitutive of following Jesus. And we begin to see those in what we were reading in the Acts of the Apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear, what are the practices? These first followers of Jesus, when they start gathering people together, what do they say you need to do to follow Jesus? Okay, believe Jesus is Lord. Great. Now what's next? What do you do? Well, we read in the Acts of the Apostles, what they did is they learned together about Jesus. They spent time in community, getting to know each other, talking about what's important they ate together, and they prayed together. And that was their daily routine. That's how they followed Jesus. Those were the practices that made the first church the church. 
This is what they did day in and day out. And, and as they did this, as they ate together and prayed together and spent time together and learned together, as they lived together like this, it began to change them. They began to have their possessions in common. So that if one person was in need, another person would help. Another person would take care of them. And as we read on through Acts, this is not just a one-time event. This is not just one point at time at which the church really, they really nail it. No, this is how the early church functioned. We read, it's later in, in Acts 4, and it happens further on in Acts as well, that great grace was upon them, for no one was in need. And they were so tight-knit that if one had a need, another one would do something to take care of it. And to be clear what we're talking about here, this is not some sort of just someone walks in off the street. If someone walked in off the street into that church and said, I need help, they wouldn't say, well, here's what I have. They would say, no, join us in the practices of following Jesus. Become part of us. Walk with us. Pray with us. Eat with us. Worship with us. Be part of this church. Let's get underneath the surface. Let's get into the real meat of it. Let's get below the tip of the iceberg. Let's get into what matters. And as we get to know you... Then we'll see what happens. What we're seeing in the book of Acts is a t such a tightly knit group. Such an amazing group of people that in following Jesus together, they got to the point where they could even share their money and their belongings. That's how much they knew and trusted and loved each other. And this is a bit of a challenging example, isn't it? It's a kind of challenging example to read of this early church and read of how tightly knit they, they were bound together. It, I was reading of this earlier this year. I was reading in Acts earlier this year. And it happened to be about the time my brother was having his uh, cancer surgery. My brother had a, a very rare and random form of eye cancer. And so he was having this, this cancer surgery. And uh, I had to ask myself, would I bail out my brother? I mean, we're talking about medical bills, right? This is not like, oh, I need 300 bucks. This is, these are significant sums of money. When you're talking about multiple cancer surgeries within a week at one of the, the biggest hospitals in Chicago. And, and so I had to ask myself, would I write a check for thousands and thousands of dollars to bail out my brother? Do I know him well enough? Am I there for him? Will I do that for him? Well, yeah, he's my brother. That's what the early church would do for people they love and care for. I'll do that for my brother. What about my friends? Would I do, are there my, do I have friends that I'd bail out if they came to me and said, you know, Andy, I need, a, I need a medical bill paid. I need a big chunk of money. Can you write me a check for thousands? Of, there are a couple friends I do that for. But this, this, what we read in Acts goes further. It goes further because it says the church did that. What if one of you came to me and said, Andy, I need a $5,000 copay so I can have cancer surgery. Would I write you a check for that? Ain't that an interesting question? <laughs> but that's what we read about in Acts. That's what we read about in Acts. A group of people that were so tightly bound together that that's what they were willing to do. And if I, as I ask myself that question, would I write a, a $5,000 check for a church member? I've got to be honest. Here's what it'd take. I'd have to know you real well. I'd have to know you far beyond just kind of the surface level, like, hey, let's talk about politics. No, I would need to have got beneath the surface, and, and we need to have spent some time doing, well, what, what Acts describes. We will need to have spent some time praying together, and eating together, and worshiping together, and learning together. We'll need to have spent time doing the practices of church. And as we do that, okay, we'll get to a point where maybe... Maybe that becomes possible. Maybe it becomes possible that, that we could do that. That we built up the church enough, we built up the trust enough that, that we would be willing to do that for each other. I, I don't think it's a mistake that the book of Acts holds up this as the example of how amazing the early church was. Because the book of Acts, it talks about here are things they're doing, that they're full of grace, as they're doing these practices, as they learn, and as they pray, as they worship, as they eat together. And, and, and they were so tightly knit. This is the example the book of Acts uses. They were so tightly knit that they were willing to bail each other out in case of great need. They were willing to sell a house to help out someone else in the church. That's how tightly knit. And, and money was no less hard of a topic then as it is today. And that's how tightly knit they were. Ain't that impressive? Ain't that impressive? Now, I would love to get to that point as a church, as a Milan Methodist church, but I don't think we're there. I don't think we're, we're there, not, at least not yet. 
I, I actually, I'm fairly certain we're not there because when we talk about money, people get nervous. I know you get nervous because I've watched you get nervous. Kind of lean back away from me. <laughs> I watched your eyes. Now Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the important matters of life. And one of the important matters of life is money. I'm not going to talk at all about money today. I'm just going to acknowledge that that's what Jesus talks about. I'm not going to get into the details of what Jesus says. I just want to grapple with the fact that uh, if it's one of the most important things about our lives, how we use our money, why do we get so nervous when we talk about it? Even here at church. And if there's any place you should be able to talk about what's important, it's here at church. Uh, it is my belief that the reason we get so very nervous about talking about money here is that we don't practice talking about other matters of importance. We don't spend time doing talking about the other matters that, that are important in our lives. And, and we know the details about each other. We know kids' names, where you work, where you retired from. We know those type of details. But I'll tell you what we do most often here. Well, what do we do most often here? What's the thing we do most often in this church? You sit side by side and you look at me. And that really doesn't build up our ability to talk to each other about what's important, does it? I'm not much to look at either. I feel sorry for you sometimes. But, you know, that's what we do. We, we sit here and we, we're quiet. We all sit there very respectfully and we all look at Andy. And, and what would it mean to start doing more, to practice, to, to practice talking about what's important. And I, I think we need to. The, the image that comes to mind, to go from sitting here all very nice, respectful, dressed up here, uh, to go from that to talking about money, one of the most important matters of our lives, to, to, to jump from, from point A to point B with nothing in the middle, it, it'd be like saying, here, here's a basketball. You never ha dribbled before? Here's how to dribble. Now go play in the NBA. I mean, you just can't make that jump, at least without getting really nervous. And so what I think we need to do is practice. Remember, following Jesus, there's a set of practices about following Jesus. And how do we practice talking about what is important? It's one of the, the, the first practices of the church, right? They gathered together for fellowship and they ate together and they talked about what mattered. They talked about what was important. And so what do we need to do to start practicing that? To start to get to know each other better. To be, know each other beyond what's on the surface. To know each other beyond what talking about the weather and talking about other such matters. Well, Tech Sample, who I mentioned before, he uh, has a suggestion. I think it is a wise one. And what he suggests is we need to practice talking to each other and hearing each other's stories. And what he calls, doing the, what he calls this is he calls this a one-on-one, -on -one, which sounds just a little bit serious, and it, it's not. Let, let me explain what he is suggesting. What tech, tech Sample suggests we as a church need to practice doing, you invite someone over for coffee, you brew a pot of coffee, you tell them when they show up, we're in this church together, and I don't know you all that well, and I, I really would like to. Can I ask you a question or two? And then you ask them a, a, a question of importance. You ask them a question that matters. You ask them a question like, what do you want most for your family? You ask them a question like, what story do I need to hear about your life to understand what makes you tick? Ask a question like, what brought you to this church and what keeps you here? Or, or another question. I mean, there's, there's no set right answer. And, and you, you sit down, you have a cup of coffee, you ask someone an important question, and then you listen. You don't interrupt, you listen. Don't give advice, listen. That's it. Not, not challenging, right? You just invite someone over for coffee, 30, 45 minutes, tell them, you know, I just want to get to know you, you're someone in the church with me, and ask a question, listen without interrupting, maybe ask another question afterwards, maybe the other person asks you a question. Eh, this, this is not a science, there's no right or wrong way to do this, you're just sitting down to practice talking about what's important and getting to know the other people here in this church. Now, I said that this is a practice, and so we're going to practice it in a minute. You all got a handout that gives you the instructions. And we're going to do this in a minute. You're going to pair off with someone that I don't expect you to pair off with. It means someone you're probably not sitting next to right now. Pair off with someone of a different generation, a different gender, a different... Just, just pair off with someone that you don't know all that well. And we're going to practice this, and we're going to ask each other a question that matters. And we're going to listen to what the other person says. Not that hard, right? And what, we're going to practice this. We're going to practice this after I get done because I believe that as we do this, we're going to become more and more like that first century church. 
We're not at the point where we can talk to each other honestly and openly about the most important matters in our lives. But we can get there. We can get there. By the grace of God, as we, as we live together, as we do, go through these practices of worship, of community, of eating together, God will work through us and transform us and build up this community such that we are able to be full of grace, such that no one goes without what they need. So here, we're, here we go. You got your, your, your instructions? Um, I'll tell you when to switch. Um, could we get some more down here? The row third down right here. Darn it, and that row. Give, give them each a copy. Anyone else need a copy? Can you grab, send a copy down to Cully? I'm sorry. And Cully down here in the front. Okay. So get up. Go pair off with someone you haven't talked to at length or you don't know all that well and ask each other a question that matters. I'll tell you when to switch and make sure the other person asks a question too. I'm going to jump in here and if I'm interrupting something, good. Go have coffee. Continue. Finish telling the story. Now, was this worth it? Is it worth it to take the time to talk about what's important? Obviously you couldn't do it all the time. It's important at times to talk about the weather. But if we as a church begin to talk about what's important, if we get good at that, it's not just the ability to talk about money that where it helps. It says in the book of James to confess your sins to, to another brother or sister. Well, if you've practiced talking about what's important, now you'll have someone to talk to when you need to confess, when you fall short. It talks about in, in the scripture, you get to points where you can't find God because you're in the middle of grief. And, and who do you turn to when you can't find God in the middle of the grief? You turn to someone with whom you've practiced talking about what is important. And so my challenge to you is to have coffee with each other or tea or orange juice or whatever your beverage of choice is with each other once a month. Just pick someone you don't know all that well in the church. Just once a month go and have coffee and talk about what's important. Ask a question that matters. And in doing so, let's build up the body of Christ. Amen.